I think we will see we will see an initial uh, jump as people are getting very tired of being locked up. So they will all come out, and suddenly you're gonna see an initial big jump in retail, and then and then it will probably probably peter out. Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to Victor Agtan. Victor is the owner of Hawker Chan and Tim Ho Wan, two fantastic restaurants in the city of Melbourne. And we are speaking today in the light of the Premier's announcements that dining in Melbourne is finally allowed to gear up to open from Monday, November 2. Still with uh, severe number restrictions, with the density restrictions and with lots of COVID safe activities, but nevertheless, there is a little flutter of hope in the air. We are getting there. Victor, thank you so much for coming along to have a chat to me on Dirty Linen today. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. So, Victor, let's um, just start by telling us about your restaurants for people who have not had the pleasure yet. Okay. Uh, we've got two restaurants going now. Actually, uh, we've got two uh, groups of restaurants. One is a uh, yum cha restaurant, uh, and that's on uh, on uh, Burke, Burke Street. And the other one is actually a rice and noodle restaurant. And we got three. Uh, we have actually currently we have four outlets. Uh, one is on the Longsdale, and one in Chatston uh, Food Court. And there's going to be two in Box Hill. One that was open just before uh, the pandemic struck. So very soon after that, we had to close. But there's another one in Box Hill, same place uh, that hasn't opened at all. Um, so that's a two. Yeah, that's a two group of restaurants. One is uh, Yam Cha, and the other one is uh, Chicken Rice and Noodles. Yeah. Well. Uh, you, you're, I think you're really underselling them because they're both really exciting, game-changing restaurants. I remember when Tim Ho Wan came to Melbourne. There were, or well, they're still, they're, you know, when we were still allowed to eat in restaurants, there were there were queues, and um, it's got so many dishes that uh, you know people travel across town to enjoy. Um, just fantastic dumplings as well as. Um, yeah, the Yum Cha Banquet dishes and Hawker Chan, it's just got such a vibe. Um, it's almost like a, a canteen. You line up, get your um, tray and just, yeah, exceptional chicken rice and lots of other dishes, noodle dishes and just a really, really fun vibe, like lots of international students in normal times um, as well as, yeah, city shoppers and people that are working in the city. So definitely they're, they're, they're both restaurants that really depend upon a vibe. They're, you know, they're, there's a lot of turnover. So the foot traffic is a big part of, of what you do. And, of course, as you talk about those um, branches in Chadson and Box Hill, you know, of course they also depend upon foot traffic and, you know, that that that, that, that turnover and that busyness so certainly things are quite different at the moment aren't they Victor? Oh yes they are uh, yeah the uh, both restaurants are actually uh, franchise and uh, they had uh, they had both have uh, Michelin stars overseas uh, so when we opened there were very long queues um but yeah, I guess you know now things are really going to change, and we we can only venture to guess what the future is going to look like. Uh, Tim Ho Wan itself is now doing just takeaway, and it's still sustainable. But Hoga Chan, of course, we are pleased. Well, I was just going to ask you what you think about the immediate future and in terms of the gov Victorian government announcements today. How are you feeling about that? Well, we we feel that it's it's probably going to be uh, a substantial improvement for for uh, for us. We saw that um, release once when when we went to oh I can't really remember the steps uh, step lockup 
Yeah, it's all a blur. <laughs> and we had, yeah, we had, uh, t- yeah. we were allowed 20 uh, dining customers. We saw a, a dramatic pickup at that point of time. Even though, um, surprisingly, even though uh, the seating for Tim Owen was like uh, 96, and 20 is only about <clears throat> a quarter of the capacity. Uh, it was a substantial pickup, so we were seeing average turnover of more than, say, forty percent for a twenty seater, which is quite surprising. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I think we will see we will see an initial uh jump as people are getting very tired of being locked up, so they will all come out, and suddenly you're gonna see an initial big jump in retail and then and then it will probably probably peter out over the longer term. Mm. But hopefully as that initial excitement peters out, the restrictions will also ease and perhaps things can reach some sort of equilibrium. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, I, I it will reach reach an equilibrium. I mean that that point of equilibrium is where where we actually are trying to figure out where is that point? Uh, is it going back to what it used to be? My guess is uh, is not going to be. It's it's gonna it's gonna change. Things are gonna change uh, quite substantially, and we're probably going to be social distancing for a long time to come, aren't we? Yeah, I reckon that that's going to be part of the landscape for a good while. And I mean, I'm thinking now about your restaurant in the food court at Chadston. I mean, I think food court dining is a, is a way behind restaurants. What do you think about that that part of the business? Um, food court um, Chadston will pro- we are not expecting very good results from it because um, for us the the demographic is still. Uh, predominantly Asian for the, f- the kind of food we serve. Um, whereas Box Hill will probably, you see, Box Hill is more of a Asian center. Uh, we'll see fairly substantial business there. But I think the Cheston one, we are not expecting too much. From it. Right. So do you, why do you think that? Um, we look, we've been looking at the the customer base we have, and it is it is still a comfort food for for Asians, but not a comfort food for Caucasians, uh, Caucasian Australians. Uh, so you know, and the, the population uh, of Asians in Australia isn't very big. I mean, you see a lot of them around town, but it is still only about ten percent. Uh, I like to be able to tap into the other ninety <laughs> percent that we're missing. <laughs> well, if you need an ambassador for chicken rice, I I would love to um, apply for that job because um, chicken rice is so comforting. I mean, just that beautiful poached chicken and those subtle flavors, that glistening rice. I mean. Honestly, is there anything like it? It's it's so good. Everyone needs to get onto that. You got Asian taste, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my taste. Are, I just love. I love everything. And even as I say that, I feel. I, I feel like every podcast I'm going to do for the next couple of weeks is me going to be. I'm going to be trying to eat in a restaurant by talking about it because <laughs> I'm just going to try to transport myself to that moment. But let's let's not forget that when I said comfort food, I mean you know you could you you could eat a burger every day for two weeks. Could you eat chicken rice every day for two weeks? You probably get really bored of it. Oh my god! I would so if someone said you've got to eat one of those foods for two weeks, I would eat chicken rice for a month compared to eating a burger for a week. Oh, really? Yeah, definitely. Well, you want the unusual ones. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the, you know, the Asian Melbourne. Um, uh, so many of the Asian uh, people that live in Melbourne usually are international students or graduates. Um, th- that landscape has changed quite a bit. Can, can you talk about how that affects your businesses, both from the 
uh, workforce side of things and also from the customer side of things? Well, um, mostly, say about 80% of our customers are Asian. And uh, a lot of them, are, these are the same people that the, the uh, international students, lots of them. Uh, almost all our employees are from that uh, from the international students side, I think about 50% of our registered employee, we've got about 60 or 70 of them, uh, have left left uh, Australia. Uh, we are not sure whether they're coming back or what's going to happen, but um, they couldn't support themselves, although well, the restaurant did offer that uh, all, all the students free food uh, if they want to. They, they're staying around, even though they don't have a job. But uh, I don't think a lot of them actually end up staying around. Mm. Yeah, well, it's so hard. I mean, that's really generous of you to offer them free food. But, of course, they've also got rent and bills and, of course, education expenses. Those bills don't stop even if um, they're not attending the institution. So it's a really tricky position but I mean that that makes me wonder how you are going to gear back up and open your businesses um, there are still there are still enough uh, enough uh, uh, registered employees for us to be able to open um, it will be it will be harder than what it used to be uh, we used to have a pool to select from maybe now we we will probably have to be less selective. Mm. That's interesting because that's something that people have talked about at every level of the hospitality industry and all the different sectors and nooks and crannies, you know, at the fine dining end when people have talked about their temporary visa workers leaving Melbourne or leaving Victoria or leaving Australia. They talk about that sort of skills drain at the top end where it's just people and, and that, you know, who is there that can fill those roles? Some of these sponsored workers are, are here because their skills weren't um, evident in the local population. And I think, you know, you're speaking about something that's at a different place in the market, but again, it's, um, you know, we'll be relying on different people and perhaps not your first choices to fill some of those roles and to, um, yeah, get food to Melbourne diners. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm not even sure uh, that the how many of the restaurants uh, around that's going to actually come back, or how many will be closed permanently. See, these are the these are the unknowns at the moment. Uh, we know that a few restaurants have already decided not to open uh, because the the costs of maintaining it. Uh, at the moment, it's quite high compared with the revenue you can generate from takeaways. Uh, for instance, uh, Dragon Boat, who's been around for 30 or years, have decided they're not going to open. Uh, there's a couple more that's been closed just before it. Uh, and a few more other smaller restaurants. I know. What do you think when you hear that? I mean, does it make you think... I don't know, like, how does it strike you? To me, it's, it's, it's really sad, but I also can't help but think, well, you know, perhaps that means, you know, the custom that is there, perhaps the restaurants that are able to hang on and reopen, perhaps they will do all right, even if the overall custom base, customer base is down. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do feel sad about it. Um, but, yeah, on the other hand, yes, uh, you've got, now you've got uh, less competition for, probably a smaller customer base. Um, I think that the, this environment will change quite substantially on the longer term. I think takeaway and delivery is going to, going to grow uh, much like the same way online shopping has been growing. Right. So you think you'll continue with the takeaway as well? Yes, we definitely will. We've seen that grown as well over this uh, lockdown period. Of course, you would because they can't they can't dine, so they got to take away. Mm. 
Yeah, of course. But then does it does having that expensive city real estate start to make less sense if a large portion of the business is driving food away and not giving people that customer experience? Um, yeah, I think I think the uh, that there's a lot of that. Um, the dining experience would still be there, but you're going to see a fairly substantial decline. At least we think we'll see a fairly substantial decline in the dining experience type. Mm. And let's talk about the CBD because, you know, when people talk about Melbourne's recovery, I think the, the city centre is the place that people are most concerned about without as many students, without as many office workers. How are you um, thinking about the CBD and uh, how you can make it work for you? We we believe that the students will come back. Um, if we don't, yeah, we would probably have to look at the longer term solution. But we do believe the students will come back to Australia. Uh, it'll be a matter of time. Um, will we go back to normal? Um, I guess I'm thinking that maybe when things come back, it'll be maybe eighty percent of what it used to be. And then take away might be might be the other twenty percent. So it's just going to be a change of uh, the way we deliver and the way that we uh, we might have to go into a diff slightly different direction and improve our our online ordering systems uh, to make sure that we can cater for the growth in that part of the market. Mm. And given that your um, restaurants are franchises from, are they both from Singapore or is Singapore or Malaysia? Yeah, both, both from Singapore. Both from Singapore. So what are the, your um, franchise partners in other um, locations telling you about how business has come back or about how systems have changed or perhaps how menu preferences have changed? Is there any sort of intel that you can glean from those people? No, the, the uh, shutdown is not as severe as ours. I think you, you might know that Melbourne's got one of the most severe shutdowns uh, in this part of the world. Uh, they they were still able to operate, and some of them were able to operate their restaurants, even though this, their, position, their COVID position was very similar to ours. Right. So, <laughs> they're no help. <laughs> Melbourne's just really working it out. We're just really working it out for ourselves over here, aren't we? But, yeah. But honestly, I feel like, you know, as you said at the beginning, you know, that there is – something to be glad about like we are getting there and um i think generally following the announcement i thought i would hear look it's hard for it's hard for everybody and it you know i think when you've got these restrictions it it's hit some people harder than others um for some people you know 10 diners is kind of workable and for a lot of people it's absolutely unworkable um, so yeah, it's not, it's definitely not a, a level playing field, but, uh, I would rather be in Melbourne's position right now than in many countries throughout Europe and certainly in the U S as well. I think the, the idea that, uh, CBD, um, uh, Melbourne, uh, City Hall have decided that maybe we could be allowed to do, uh, outside dining. Uh, we we are very keen on that, but um, no, there's still a lot of restriction with that too. So uh, we we've been we've been working trying to get this thing going, uh, external external dining, but the space is always the the problem. Where are they going to sit? Yeah, well, I think we've heard a lot of positive noises from state and local government about outdoor dining and I think some people imagine that that means it's all sorted but it's not really is it no it's not uh, you've got to look at the uh, the weather every day and make sure that you know it's not going to rain if you are really outside if you are under the under the uh, walkways then how much space do you have to be able to do anything? 
And what about the infrastructure and the permits? How is that, how are those processes going? I think we're we're going through that at the moment. Uh, it's still not very clear how that's going to work. Uh, whether we would we would do the uh, the space up ourselves or whether the city hall would do it, we still don't know what's going on here. So. Yeah, well, I think that's the same for a, a lot of people where. The intention is there, um, but yeah, the no one's got. Yeah, the execution is still to be worked out, and yeah, it can't just be a free for all. I mean, there has to be some kind of um, yeah. The has the regulations are there to keep everybody safe and to make it work for everybody. Um, but it's uh, it, it, we kind of need it, and I suppose now we've got a deadline in Melbourne. Um, people are going to be really pressuring the council to sort some of these issues out. That's true. Yeah. We are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you can get it sorted. Um, I'm trying to decide when we're allowed to open if I'm going to go to Tim Ho Wan or Hawker Chan first. I'm not sure. Which one are you most excited about getting back into for a meal? I think Tim Ho Wan would be a better one to go go there first. Okay, and what should I eat? Uh, everything that's good. <laughs> so uh, the the whole menu is pretty. Uh, it's a very not a very big menu, but uh, everything is made fresh. Uh, when we, I guess that's the difference between us and the other restaurants. Uh, dumplings are generally frozen. They're uh, they're made and frozen and cap and steam when when you, you want it. But in Timo one, you order it and we we'll start making it. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go in. I'm going to order one of everything and I'm going to be extremely happy. Um, Victor, thank you so much for sharing your perspective today on Dirty Linen. It's fantastic to hear from you. I wish you all the very best in getting your outdoor dining sorted. I wish you fine weather. Happy customers and excellent staff. And I really hope you're correct that the international students are going to flow back to Melbourne. We need them. A lot of changes coming up. There are. Thank you very much. No worries. Great to have a chat. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.